Greetings from Long Island, where every highway is a sunrise. It's time for Dave's Gone By, an hour of comedy, talk, and music brought to you by Total Theater, with your host, Dave Lefkowitz. You've never heard anything like it, so sit back, relax, squeal if you must. Here's the host of Dave's Gone By, Dave! Tropical hot dog night! Yes, it is a tropical, truly a tropical hot dog night tonight on Dave's Gone By with me, Dave Lefkowitz. Happy to be here on AM 1240 WGBB for this August 13th, 2006 edition of my show, the 184th program that we've done. And this is, this is going to be a really cool one. It is a tropical and floral night because I'm going to be talking, well, actually, I'm not going to be talking, but have two special guests. And we may even have three. And it's, it's actually going to get so crowded in here, we're going to have to smash through one of the walls. Because most of the time, it's just me here, nattering away, just, just things spewing out of my mouth. But actually, we're going to have other people spewing, as well as myself. First of all, one of the, the prime and most marvelous spewers that we sometimes have on the program is a fellow named Peter Fitzgerald. And uh, Peter is a pretty wonderful fella. He is the vice president of an organization called Wigglefar, the Woodmere Gay. Uh, oh, let me get that right. The Woodmere Gay and Lesbian Front, and Rear. And he's well, pretty open and honest and out about all his stuff. So I thought he would be the ideal person to talk to our special guest which is another vice president, the vice president of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And, uh, well, you know what, I'll get to that in, in just a bit, because I, I also want to talk about a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, it's going to be pretty neat. So he'll be here, and I'm hoping also that my good friend Jeff Goodman will stop in a bit later. He's been on a few shows recently, and he saw two plays in New York today. So he's literally coming in on the train and might be driving in. So it'll be a while, I think, before he gets here. But he saw two new Broadway shows, the Martin Short uh, comedy and Kiki and Herb, both on Broadway. So kind of interested to hear from him on that and just whatever else he's been doing, because he also just got back from Florida. But I, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me explain that Dave's Gone By is a mix of comedy, talk radio, music, interviews, sketches, songs, all that kind of stuff, all rolled into this sort of <clears throat> strange little gastric lump, that uh, a bolus. It's a bolus ball of radio, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm proud to do every single week, uh, Sunday nights at 11. I host it, and... Um, Happy to, and it just seems to be picking up a little speed for some reason these days. I don't know. I've been doing it for three and a half years, and yet recently more people are like listening. I want to give a shout out to a couple of people at uh, my local library, the wonderful Pam, who's who's like my biggest fan, and amazingly enough, not my only fan, but but close to it, and she's been wonderful. She went into one of the sponsors, Hewlett Minuteman Press, and said, "Oh, thank you so much." for sponsoring this wonderful show. I think you guys are terrific, and, and, you know, the show's the funniest thing I ever heard, which, you know, I probably something a little mentally off with her if she thinks that. But, but God bless you, Pam. Thank you so much. And she didn't actually buy anything at Unit Minute Man Press. She went in there, talked to them for about 10 minutes, and said how great it was that they were sponsoring me, but actually didn't, didn't give them any money. So... It's sort of a half-win situation there, but, but the thought was there, Pam, and I, and I thank you so much. And also Glenn, good, good pal Glenn, who I know is listening out on the island and um, is listening very closely also to Peter Fitzgerald. And it was great to see him uh, this afternoon because I was at a retirement party for one of the people at the library, Leslie, and I wish her well. She'll still be working there for two more weeks, but then she's off probably to move to Washington. So really nice lady, really smart lady, and, and loves movies, and it's always great talking with her about movies. Anywho, no movies tonight. we got flowers and all sorts of stuff. want to mention to you, first of all, before I get rolling, that um, the show is brought to you by Hewlett Minuteman Press and... Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine, the Bible of the Broadway industry. It's not just Broadway. It's off-Broadway, off-off, dance, cabaret, opera, you name it. If it's happening on the stages of New York, Performing Arts Insider has it. And you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Also, 
wonderful sponsors, MortgagesRock.com. Again, it's not just they give people mortgages. It's about helping you give people mortgages. What you do, you go on the website and you learn how mortgages are done. It's an ABC, very simple, simply explained how the whole concept of mortgages works. And so they do that. You learn it. And then you try and help your friends, your acquaintances get the money that they need to rebuild, to buy a new house for college loans, whatever they need it for. And then you get commission when you help them. It's as simple as that. Mortgagesrock.com, licensed in New York State and a whole bunch of other states. And um, Mortgagesrock.com is where making money never sounded. So good. And speaking of good sounds, everybody, make sure you listen to Joyce Keller Wednesday nights at 11. She's a supporter of the show. She does, she's been on the air for more than a decade on WGBB. She's a radio psychic, which is kind of neat. So, um, hey to Joyce Keller, and also hey to Vic Fusco, who has currently two programs on Sunday night on WGBB, Swing City which airs, I believe, at 9, and the um, 6 o'clock show, which is country music. So you don't get a lot of opportunities to hear those kinds of music on local radio. So if you like swing music, if you like country, listen on Sunday nights at 6 and 9 for two shows by my good pal, Vic Fusco. Okay, just a few things on my mind before we get to the show proper, or improper, however you prefer to label it. Well... Of course, I've been harping on the Arabs and Israelis the past few weeks, because really, when the end of the world is near, <laughs> what else is there to talk about? Hey, Marty, did you hear? North Korea, Syria, Indonesia, and Iran are stockpiling for Armageddon. Oh, no kidding, Bill. Oh, hey, my girlfriend and I just tried this new restaurant. I mean, you know, pretty much everything else pales. But at the same time, there's only so much you can say about the whole Middle East thing. Either you're strongly pro-Israel and anti-Arab, like yours truly. You think Israel is fighting the good fight and by hitting Hezbollah now, they're saving the world from a crap storm five years from now. Or you're on the other side and you think Israel overreacted and the innocent Lebanese are suffering and the Palestinians deserve a homeland on Israeli soil. And you should be euthanized for being such a naive left-wing idiot. But, I mean, look what happened this week. First, you had those Egyptian students, in quote, those students who were supposed to be heading to Montana for an exchange program. Now, granted, what the hell a bunch of Egyptians would be doing in Montana is beyond me. I don't think there are any Jews in Montana, let alone Arabs. And last time I looked at Montana... There were three farmers living there and a couple of moose. So I'm surprised six Egyptians did show up. Nobody shows up. I mean, these guys must be like the short bus Egyptians. They come all the way to America and they say, Where do you want to go? I don't know, Ahmed. Where do you want to go? I don't know, Hassan. Where do you want to go? I know. Let's go to a happening spot, Montana. And so, so they actually did follow their visas. They went to the university and they're trying to do their work there, and they're, they're taking their classes, Anti-Zionism 101, Introduction to Collateral Damage, Advanced Suicide Bombing, which is a misnomer, because Advanced Suicide Bombing is actually more remedial than Intro to Suicide Bombing. It's just that kids who fail Intro to Suicide Bombing, well, they blew it. They obviously messed up on the final. So here they still are, and they have to take something, so, the six Arabs showed up for class. Another 11 vanished. They disappeared somewhere between Kennedy Airport and Montana. Isn't that comforting? Isn't it great that five years after 9-11, one month before the fifth anniversary of 9-11, a bunch of young Arabs fitting the ultimate ideal description of terror suspects come to a New York airport and disappear. I mean, what are they? Bugs Bunny making a wrong turn at Albuquerque? Maybe they all stopped off at a 7-Eleven, which had a secret passageway to a Hezbollah training camp. Because, you know, most 7-Elevens do, right? Out of every dollar you spend on a slushie, 50 cents gets funneled back to Bin Laden to pay for his Al Jazeera TV specials. No, I'm kidding. But one of the missing Egyptians was actually apprehended 
in Minnesota. Maybe he's a big Prairie Home Companion fan. He saw the movie, started wondering what actual Minnesotans look like. Dead. Oh, and, and then they caught another two Arabs who were kind enough to turn themselves in, in New Jersey. New Jersey, Montana, honest mistake. Now, authorities say none of these Arab kids, not even the two who are still missing, is a security threat. They're not here for terrorism. They're not here for Islamic training camps. Still, we got to catch these guys because if they're not here for terror, that can mean only one thing. They want to stay in this country, infiltrate the system, and take away quality dishwashing and bathroom cleaning jobs from hard-working illegal Mexicans. So next time you go for dim sum in Chinatown and you hear the cook hacking away at your Cantonese duck saying, and, and he says, Allah Akbar, you want egg roll? Call the authorities immediately. Because, of course, a week after the disappearing students, oh, I, I, I didn't even mention this, my wife was on jury duty last week. And these half dozen Moroccan students were picked up by the FBI on ID fraud. Now, they're not facing terrorism charges or anything like that, but they will be deported. Well, if found guilty, they may get jail time. Why do they have fake IDs, fake passports? And my wife told me, remember, by the way, she's not on the case. She can talk about it. She's sitting there in the grand jury room where everybody gets to hear everything. And, and all the potential jurors are looking at these dudes and thinking, okay, 9-11, Muslims, Arabs, ID fraud, doctored passports, and the same look goes through everyone's eyes, the look that says, glad we caught him now. And yet, the judge says, now jury, remember, this isn't about terrorism, or Al-Qaeda, or Islamic fundamentalists, it's just about ID fraud. And it was all the jury could do not to laugh in the judge's face and say, oh, come on, look at them. Give them a couple of box cutters, and they'll all be right at home in the cockpit of an American Airlines jet going, God is great, time to die. Now, thank God my wife did not get on that jury, because knowing her, she would actually give them a fair trial. She would give them the benefit of a doubt and be like, so they're 25 years old and still going to camp in the summer. So they have death to America scrawled on the inside of their notebooks. So, they all have flash cameras, timing devices, and candle wicks stuffed up their asses. So did Rock Hudson in his heyday. And of course, a week after the Egyptian crew split, three days after the grand jury started trying these Moroccans, then we get the great shampoo terror plot of Ought Six. Nice, huh? Fifty Arabs living across the pond in England think it would be a cool thing to blow up ten commercial airliners over the Atlantic. And this time they've gotten more subtle. Who needs lowly box cutters when you have shampoo, makeup, bottled water? And they were going to sneak explosive liquids and powders onto the plane in typical carry-on items. <clears throat> then, assumedly, they would go into the bathrooms and assemble the actual bombs. Now, it's amazing. For 10,000 years... The Arabs can't irrigate a desert. They can't get along with each other. And they can't get one other country in the Western or Eastern world to think of them as anything more than scum. But they can go on a United Airlines jet and assemble an explosive. Maybe there's a terrorist cookbook in the back of the Koran. In the index, you know, after all the Muhammad garbage and the mountains moving and the camels moving and the bowels moving, you flip to the back of the book, and if you can read the chicken scratch writing, it actually says, take two parts gelignite to one part nitrogen and a heaping tablespoon of iron filings. And who the hell knows? All I know is that once again, the Arabs have managed to make flying even less comfortable than it was before. First, the airlines took away meals, just an economic thing. So people have been forced to bring food and drinks with them when they get on. Now, you bring a sandwich in a Poland spring, you got to throw it in the trash before you board. And no deodorant. Now, people on airplanes do not smell too good to begin with. You want to make them stow their right guard in checked luggage or do without Arik Extra Dry altogether? And, and they're mistaken if they think this will help catch terrorists. In fact, it makes it even harder for security guards because without deodorant, everyone's going to smell like an Arab. 
And again, as always, you get a massive generic response to a specific threat with ramifications that are 99.9% .9 pointless. I mean, you ban all old people from carrying a bottle of cough medicine because some 20-year-old Pakistani might have a Robitussin bottle full of TNT. Now, I will tell you who is responsible for this terror threat. Not Al-Qaeda. Not Islamic cells. I will bet you that the real culprit is Johnson & Johnson. Imagine a quarter of a million people getting to their destination and having to buy brand new bottles of shampoo, mouthwash, and hair gel. There's probably some evil genius in the basement of J&J &J going, why didn't we think of this before? Ten to one, there's another evil genius at Samsonite trying to invent a way to scare airport security into making passengers throw out their luggage. I'm sorry, sir, you can take your belongings in these garbage bags, but your suitcase has to go to recycling. I mean, really, the, that scenario makes as much sense as anything when you're telling people they can't bring a tube of toothpaste on a business trip. And yet, heaven forbid, we should have racial profiling. Heaven forbid, we should spare people throwing out hundreds of dollars of perfume and cologne instead of giving a direct once-over to every 20 or 30-year-old male who looks like he just flew into Kennedy on a magic carpet. In the interest of appearing fair, you delay a million people instead of saying to one moody-looking Pakistani, excuse me, sir, can I see your luggage? Can you empty your pockets? Can I see the last 20 people you called on your cell phone? Are you violating his civil rights? Possibly. But if he's not from our country, he doesn't have our civil rights. And if he is, you're sparing everybody else's civil right to carry their own belongings from one place to another in America. It is so goddamn nuts. And people still don't realize that what Israel is doing in South Lebanon is fighting the same people we're dealing with in London. It's this radical Islamic faction. And you can call it Hamas or PLO if they're still around or Hezbollah. And the more we kill of them, the more we hamper their efforts, blow up their factories, raid their training camps, arrest their operatives, it's that much longer that we go without another September 11th. I've said it a million times on this program, I will say it again. Do not ask me to weep for the poor Palestinians, or the displaced Lebanese, or even the dead Iraqis. Any one of these would wipe Israel off the map with two beats of a cold black heart. And any one of these would bomb a whole lot more of Manhattan than the World Trade Center. I mean, it's a dirty little secret in this country. But sometimes it's okay to hate the enemy if they're really the enemy. Hating someone for skin color, hating someone for genetic birth, senseless, it's wrong. We all do it to some extent or other, but it's nothing to defend or be proud of. But hating an ideology that wants to see you dead... I can hate that with no friggin' problem. And hating a people who have, time and again, attacked innocent people all over the world for the, sa for the sake of a supposedly peaceful religion, at a certain point you gotta say, it's us versus them, and we gotta get them, whatever they are, wherever they're doing, and if that means looking twice or three times at anyone whose name is Khalil or Mustafa, so be it. I mean, a bunch of rowdy teenagers go into a convenience store. The owner watches them like a hawk because they're more likely than 50-year-olds to steal things and break things. It's profiling, and it's perfectly understandable. I'm not saying there aren't middle-aged shoplifters, but they don't come in gangs, and they don't heist a six-pack while distracting the owner by calling him a poo. You know, it's like that great scene in American Splendor. You go in a supermarket... And you see an 80-year-old Jewish woman with six items and 12 coupons, you know to get on another checkout line. Speaking of profiling, totally different topic, totally. But if February is Black History Month and March is Women's History Month, August has to be Rehab Month. August is History Catching Up with Celebrities Month. I mean, first, Mel Gibson, Naomi Campbell getting sued by yet another bruised assistant, Robin Williams going into rehab for a drinking problem after staying sober for two decades. Honestly, how could anyone tell when he was drunk? Hi, my name is Robin Williams. I used to be on a TV show called Mork and 
I used to snort cocaine, but I was young. A 60-year-old has no business snorting cocaine. Now I just mix it in with my Megamucil. Now, now, you think there's any stuff we're not hearing about the Robin Williams announcement? Maybe he pulled a Mel Gibson that did not make the papers? He got arrested and started saying, You know, black people are responsible for all the fried chicken in the world. Or Williams goes up to an Irish cop and slurs, Are you black? Uh, and I wonder, who's going to be next on the rehab circuit? One of the Simpsons? Not Homer, I mean Ashley or Jessica. One of the Hiltons? Paris Hilton is in rehab for sluts. Do you read that? She's tired of boyfriends and is now going celibate. She told GQ, quote, I'm not having sex for a year. I'll kiss, but nothing else. Want to bet she gains like 80 pounds? I mean, she's going to be putting something in her mouth, right? I don't know. I think she's just trying to build up anticipation for the sequel to her movie, and I don't mean House of Wax, House of Cox, perhaps. And by Cox, of course, I mean of the bird variety, a little-known animated film she did where she played the voice of a rooster. Well, a rooster that deep-throated penises. But enough of that. Time to move past my rant ranting and tell you about this week's show. I had the, the buzzer bell remind me that I'm, I'm pressed for time here. So, I want to tell everybody that Peter Fitzgerald is going to be here in just a couple of minutes. He's the vice president of Wigglefar, the Woodmere Gay Lesbian Front and rear, and he's going to be talking with the Vice President Patrick Colina. He's Vice President of Horticulture at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Yes, let's all make the joke. You can lead a horticulture, blah, blah, blah. Well, he's, they're both going to be talking about the Titan Arum flower. And you can actually see a picture of it. I put it on my website at davesgoneby.org. D-A-V is in Victor, E-S, goneby.org. And you can see that the Latin name for this thing is Amorphophallus titanium. I'm sure uh, Peter will have some things to say about that. But it's an amazing looking plant. And the flowering, as I said before, gives off a stink and a stench for like two days. And yet people come from all over the world to experience it. It's wonderful. And also tonight, if there's time, I want to do a little DJing. I really enjoy doing the Pete Fornatella theme set on WUSB a couple of weeks ago. I was there at a different radio station and was there for three and a half hours just playing music, being DJing. I loved it. So I'm going to do a little bit of that tonight. Uh, I've got three songs about people falling in love or more correctly, having unrequited feelings for people at different places of work. You know, the kind of fantasy we all have for the cute waitress or the good-looking me mechanic. Three neat songs, including one from a new album and cookbook compiled by Christine Lavin, a really good friend of the show. So, politics, comedy, talk, and music. And also, Jeff Goodman just got here, my friend, so he'll probably try and be on in the last few minutes as well. It's the usual stew on Dave's Gone By, but right now... I'm going to do a couple of commercials and be back with Peter Fitzgerald interviewing Patrick Kalina from the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. Don't go away. If I were a rich man, I, uh... I, were a rich man, I could do the Dave's Gone By show for years and years and never have to worry about money. But that's not the way things have worked out. So, I need your help. You can help me by helping yourself by advertising or sponsoring segments on Dave's Gone By. It's easy, it's cheap. Just go to davesgoneby.com and see the rate card, davesgoneby.com, and bring your message to my listeners and make us both rich. Big house with the roof. I need more Dave! Oh, I hear that all the time. Once a week is not enough. But you can get all the Dave you want on CD. Dozens of complete episodes, just $14 per disc, shipping and handling included. And one more dollar for a personal autograph. Dave's Gone By CDs come with jewel cases, photos, liner notes, makes a great gift. So, for more info, check our website or email davesgoneby at aol.com and ask for the CD list. Thanks, Dave! You want love?
The flowers that bloom in the spring. Chala! Oh my goodness, I am so happy to be here on Dave's Gone By on this wonderful Sunday evening, and I'm excited because there's a flower that we're going to be talking about, and I love flowers to begin with because I am so florid and floral, but I don't have the flower at my house, and by George, you've never seen it in your house or any of your neighbors. This is a special one, and they've imported it all the way to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden because I've got to care for it very gently, very carefully, and I'm not going to tell you why. I have the Vice President of Horticulture at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden to tell us all about this amazing plant. Hello, Patrick Kalina. Hello. Nice to see you. Talk to you. I mean, you're not seeing me yeah, by I know. Well, we're a little delirious here at uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, I have to say. Oh, is, is, is the smell coming yet? The smell has come. Oh, dear. It is not quite as intense as it was. It's really only the first 12 hours where that's intense and and uh, and really overwhelming. And then now it it comes in little waves every once in a while. But well, so do I. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Excuse it, me. It, it just every once in a while you get a little little bit of it, but that's all. Well, well, let, let's roll back, shall we? Let's like a foreskin. Let's just roll it back and tell us about this new, well, not new, but this big flower that you have. What is it? Where is it? How is it? Tell us. Tell. Okay. What is it? It is Amorphophallus titanum. The Amorpho titanum. what? Amorph yes, I know. That's uh, it gets people's attention. It's uh, named for its uh, its. General shape, which you can uh, enjoy on our website at uh, www.bbg.org. And what we do, we put up a webcam that takes pictures every minute or so, that, so that people can see this plant evolve, because it really is an evolving thing. And it, it is a beautiful plant. It, it's one of the world's largest flowers. Uh, this particular version of it is almost six feet tall. Good heaven! And it is a very rare thing. It's sort of rare in its native environment, which is Sumatra. It's rare to find it in a garden, and it's even rarer to bloom. We've, it's taken us ten years to get a flower, so this is a, this is a big deal. Ten, in other words, they, ten years ago, somebody planted a seed, and then and, and in the middle of is it Indonesia? Where the hell is Sumatra anyway? Sumatra is in Indonesia. Okay, so and we we got uh, a seedling that was imported uh, via a collector in North Carolina, a nursery, mm -hmm. and we have been growing this plant on year after year after year with hopes that one day we'd see a flower. And you should understand, uh, this plant has not bloomed in New York City since 1939. This is a pretty unusual uh, occurrence that's taking place. Well, but is, is it because, well, certainly it couldn't grow in New York because of our climate. Right. But the, the garden, the botanic never imported one and tried this before since 1939? Right. We've, we've, well, we've only had the plant for 10 years. In 1939, New York Botanic Garden in the Bronx bloomed it, and they bloomed it for the second time. They were the first garden in the country to do so. But... It is a pre-mercurial item, so you, you never know what you're going to get or why. We don't know why it's blooming now. We're just happy that it is. And right now, if you can, you know, you check that web picture, you'll see scores of people standing around gawking at a plant that's larger in most cases than they are. Well, you said it actually grows really, even though it takes 10 years to blossom, the darn thing is growing, what, like an inch an hour or something, or an inch a day? How does that work? Well, it kind of go, it goes in, in a burst for a short period of time uh, during the summer, and then it will go dormant after a while. But what we saw this year was, a, instead of a leaf stem coming up, a, a flower bud. And imagine it, it looked like a yellow uh, crayon. And it started to grow up. It got to be about five and a half, uh, almost six feet tall. And slowly, it's wrapped by a thing that looks sort of like a cabbage leaf. That starts to fold back and creates this beautiful burgundy, uh, sort of Elizabethan collar effect around a yellow spike. It's pretty dramatic. My goodness. But also, let's, let's remind people one of the things that, that drew people to this is not just the size of the thing, although size does matter. I hate to tell that to people. Right. But there's also an odor component. There is an odor component. It's pretty, pretty fascinating. And I think this is one of the things that really grabs people. It, the, in its native environment, it, it is only, or anywhere, it's only available to be pollinated for a couple of days. And in its native environment, it's pretty rarely encountered. So it needs a big homing beacon for its pollinators which in the case of this plant are plants that would be a attracted to what in essence we would call roadkill. So it's, it's mimicking the scent of a dead animal to draw in sweat bees or carrion beetles, and that is the insect that pollinates this particular plant. Sweat bee? Sweat bees. What is a sweat bee? Who knew? Bee? No, I, I have no idea. I mean, if you kick over a, a 
a hive of sweat bees, what happens? I mean, I would assume it would be unpleasant, but yeah. that's just uh, that's not a scientific answer. But are they actual bees, or is that just another kind of a? No, it, 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 it's, we're talking about an Indonesian insect species, and we don't have those here, obviously, and we don't even have lots of other plants for this pollination to take place. But what we managed to do this year was we were fortunate that Virginia Tech bloomed their plant a couple of weeks ago. So they were kind enough to send us their pollen, and, and we're using that pollen today to pollinate the uh, our plant with the hopes that we'll generate some seed for other gardens. Nice. So, so the whole world can stink. Well, it doesn't stink for very long, does it? No, it's 12 hours, but it's, it's intense. And, you know, imagine um, a fishing dock at low tide. And Ooh. Get some indication of what we're talking about. But you say it's already stunk now the worst. It's, and all, all, it's already stunk the worst, but, and, I, it, and I think that what you're still getting are people sort of leaning over the ropes, trying to get a little bit. And every once in a while, like I said, you get a little wave that comes, and, and you uh, you can get a sense of what we're what we're dealing with. My goodness. And then how much longer does it have to flower, do you think? Well, we'll, we'll have it all day today and probably all day tomorrow, and we're hoping that, you know, we get a lot of visitors on the weekend. We're hoping that it'll hang around for Sunday. We'll definitely leave it out. Um, but, you know, the best way for folks to monitor how we're doing is to go on to the webcam and to get a, to get a look and to judge for themselves what uh, what this thing looks like and whether it's worth a visit, which I think they'll be convinced that it is. But, but once the flower dies, the whole thing doesn't droop over and die. It's not like it actually, you know, me yeah, after Imagine, because, again, this little... This, Yellow column. Imagine the, a pick, the peak of a witch's hat. It, it's just going to flop over, and th- that process is that starts to start to go down. It's really working. Hope we hope to make fruit. So underneath oh. that big column, there'll be a, a, an additional column of little red fruits that will produce the seed. We hope that we'll be able to turn into other plants. Well, I, I've dated a few little red fruits, and they produce some seeds for me. But that's something totally, totally different. <laughs> now, now. What is, aside from, from, first of all, you're the vice president of horticulture at the Botanic Garden. So, right. so how did you get to that position, if you don't mind my using that word? Uh, well, I've been working in, in public horticulture for, for more than a decade and, and was long familiar and, uh, uh, and a, a huge fan of this garden. This is really a terrific garden and w- was invited uh, to come and apply for this position and the rest is history. I mean, I'm, if, if for those who haven't been here, it, it's a small Garden in sort of universal terms. It was 52 acres, but in, in New York City terms, that's a lot of that's a lot of real estate. And in those 52 acres are a series of of very beautiful and and very impressive gardens and collections. So we're very fortunate that we're so popular with our our, our city neighbors and our suburban neighbors. But this is sort of an added attraction, a little bonus for uh, the folks who come and visit us to, to see something they wouldn't see every day or in a lifetime, maybe. But does it have to go back to uh, Sumatra after your, it blooms and you're done with it, or do you guys keep it for 10 more years or something? No, this is part of our collection. And, and, and what, what's great about it is this is an example of what we do. You know, when you come to the garden, you're not going to see everything every day, and you won't see everybody who works here every day. But there are a lot of people working behind doors and behind glass uh, trying to grow things that are going to entertain people, and it may take 10 years, but that's, that's part of the deal. Wow. So tell me, what is, aside from, from this wonderful Amorphophallus titanium, I just love that name, what one of your other favorite flowers at the garden? Well, pick a season, I think, and hmm. we, we, can, we can talk about... Um, well, we're, we're heading in the end of August into September, October. So. Okay, so we're looking forward now. What are we looking at? Well, right now, right outside our lily pools, or we can start with the lily pools. We have these long, formal pools that are filled with water lilies, both hardy forms and tropical forms of all colors and, and stripes. And on either side are lush, colorful borders. On uh, one side, mixed borders of perennial uh, plants and shrubs, small trees. On the other side, a mix of tropical plants, all kinds of colors, sizes, and textures. That's pretty dramatic right there. Our conservatories are filled with colorful plants now. The Rose Garden will get another boost. We have a very famous Rose Garden, the first uh, Rose Garden in a public garden in the country. And that will receive its sort of second season in September. Well, I, I never promised you a rose garden, but we're hoping. Well, I'll promise you that if you come to the rose garden in September, you will be impressed. Well, but let me ask you. You, you sort of sidestepped that question. Now. I was asking you personally, as a, as a person, not as like the representative of the, of the botanic garden, but what's your favorite flower of all year round? Well, you, you know, you can, it's hard to, nobody wants to pick a favorite child, and, and, mm-hmm. and uh, it's hard to pick a favorite. There are things that happen here seasonally that, to me, make help make the season. For example... There's a plant called uh, Carolina Allspice that blooms here in the spring, 
and it's a shrub that, with a little star-like flower, and that flower can smell like uh, pineapple or Ooh. strawberry or apple. It depends on the day, and and that and so little things like that that sort of carry along through the season. Th- those are those are particular favorites. That's pretty amazing. Are are there flowers there and plants that are even rarer and or stinkier than the Titan? Well, Adam? there's nothing that's stinkier. Um, we we have. Uh, we have another species of amorphophallus that's a little smaller that's in our in our tropical house all the time. And when that blooms, you don't really see it so much. It's kind of tucked in the back. But you can tell when you go in the house that something's not as it normally would be. So, And, and you don't blame the dog. You know it's the flower. Yeah, there's no, no dog to blame. It's, uh, we're wondering whether there is an animal of some kind in the house usually when we're looking for it. But, but um, that, that's usually in like late spring, early summer. My goodness. Well, again, please remind everybody how to get to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and, and again, they can look at the website. Just the, the usual basic info. Tell our people. Okay. Well, Brooklyn Botanic Garden is, uh, you know, reached via the two and the three subway or from the B and the Q subway, um, and that is accessible through Long Island Railroad through Atlantic Avenue. Uh, you can also drive here. We have a parking lot uh, nearby at, at Washington Avenue near Eastern Parkway. But the website, which which is really, I can I can brag about the website because it's not my department, so it's not like I'm bragging about myself. Oh, go ahead. We have a really good uh, technical staff here, and they are they have put together a website at bbg.org that has tons of information. It has a whole background of this plant, a running blog that's a pretty comical little blog, observations of different staff members about how this plant got to where it where it is, and then all of the directions and photos that you might want to have to inspire you to visit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tear yourselves away from the naked male webcams and go to bbt.org to see this wonderful flower and all the other offerings at the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. I want to thank so much Patrick Colina, Vice President of Horticulture at the BBG. Thank Thank you. you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. I've been telling you for months why you should use Ulit Minuteman Press for all your copying and printing needs. But here's one of the owners, Mike Toron, to tell you why. Hi, how you doing? At Minuteman Press, our ultimate goal is service. We are your best source for the most complete line of printed products. You can check us out on the web at www.hewlett.minutemanpress.com. $15 an issue sounds like a lot to spend for a theater magazine. But what if every issue of that magazine were jam-packed with information, like what shows are bound for Broadway, what big stars are in town, and what shows on and off Broadway are worth seeing? What if there was a whole calendar of dance, opera, and cabaret? And what if every issue had more theater information than the New York Times, Variety, and The Hollywood Reporter put together? Fifteen bucks sounds more reasonable, right? But guess what? A full year of Performing Arts Insider costs less than $14 an issue, and Dave's Gone By listeners get 10% off the subscription price, meaning you would pay just $12 an issue for all the listings, rumors, reviews, and more in Performing Arts Insider. TotalTheater.com has all the details, or call 516-295-1511 and ask about the theater magazine the professionals use and theatergoers love, Performing Arts Insider. Hello, this is Patrick Kalina, Vice President of Horticulture at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and you're listening to Dave's Gone By on WGBB. Yes, indeed, and thanks so much to Patrick Kalina of the Botanic Gardens, and of course to Peter Fitzgerald, our our wonderful interviewer. I always love uh, hearing how he tackles certain subjects in his own unique way. Well, as I tend to promise with every show, it's always a mix of comedy and talk and music, and we're really doing that tonight because open with some political monologue kind of stuff. And then, of course, we have that cool conversation about flowers. And coming up towards the very end of the show, I've got my good friend Jeff Goodman. We'll probably be talking about a little bit of theater that he's seen and maybe, if there's time, his trip to Florida. But I also wanted to do a bit of music tonight, kind of neat, uh, for basic reason is that I got a CD in the mail, courtesy, courtesy of a friend of the show, wonderful folk songstress named Christine Lavin. And uh, Christine was on the program oh, several months ago, and it was such a wonderful visit. I mean, we, we played it out over two or three separate shows because there was so much and so much wonderful stuff that she was talking about and singing and playing. Well, she is not just a folk singer-songwriter. She's also 
so involved with getting songs out there. She's almost inheriting the mantle in a way that Pete Seeger had of collecting songs from all these folks and making sure they get out, even if you know she's not the one singing them. She just wants the music heard. She wants people who may not be on a major label, or, or maybe even, even if they are, but she wants the music to be disseminated more and to be enjoyed. And to that end, she's been working with her label, Appleseed Records, and it's a wonderful folk uh, outfit. In fact, they're the current home of Tom Paxton, another folk legend who was on this program a couple of years ago. So she, her last album was on Appleseed, and now she's put together a compilation of... Not only songs, but recipes. It's a combination album and cookbook, if you can believe it. Very strange idea, but it seems to work for her. Uh, called One Meatball, because she got all these great classic and, and up-and-coming folkies to do songs involving food. And it just morphed into not just having the songs there, but having their family or their personal favorite recipes. So it comes in this very attractive a cookbook, and no, I'm not getting paid for this kind of promo. I'm just very happy that they sent it to me. And there's some really good stuff on it, and some that's, that's you know not ringing my bell. But among the folks on the album are Jeff Daniels, whom you'll know most as an actor in like The Purple Rose of Cairo. Yeah, I mean he's constantly doing movies, but he also has now a side career as a folky kind of a blues singer. He does a song. Uh, you've got, let's see, who else? You've got Pete Seeger singing, I think, with his little nephew, because Pete can't really sing all that well anymore, but he does a tune. Uh, you've got the late um, Dave Van Ronk does a story and song. She recorded him a few years back doing, I think he does the title track, One Meatball. Christine has a fun track on there that Dame Edna guests on. I mean, some, some really excellent people. My favorite song on there is by Ray Jessel, who's the 72-year-old theater songwriter. He actually wrote one Broadway show that flopped, and he wrote songs for all sorts of other shows and people. And then at in his early 70s, he decided, what the hell, I'm going to go out and perform them myself. Started doing some cabaret venues, and I wish I'd seen him, because he's wonderful. Uh, he does a a song that's not really that food oriented, but I think the song was so good that, you know, Christine daren't leave it off because it's just the best song on the CD called I Think About Sex. Really, really funny. But I'm not going to play that. I'm going to play another tune on One Meatball by Marcy Heisler and Zena Goldrich. Now, people in the cabaret community know these names because those two have been writing songs for everybody in the cabaret field. Very clever people. And a song called Taylor the Latte Boy which is kind of cute, but it totally sprang me into mind of another song about another kind of unrequited, cute, and yet touching song of unrequited love for someone in, where the location is about as important as the actual people involved and the feelings involved. So we're going to hear both Taylor the Latte Boy, performed by uh, Marcy Heisler and Zena Goldrich from the One Meatball Collection, and then a classic from Amy Rigby, called Knapsack, and then we will be back. Enjoy. There's a boy who works at Starbucks who is very inspirational. He is very inspirational because of many things. I come in at 8-11 and he smiles and says, how are you? When he smiles and says, how are you? I can swear my heart grows wings. So today at 8-11, I decided I should meet him. I decided I should meet him in a proper formal way. So today at 8-11, as he smiled and said, how are you? I said, fine, and my name's Carol. And he softly answered, hey. And I told him my name's Carol, and thank you for the extra phone. And he said his name was Taylor, which provides the inspiration for this home. Taylor, the latte boy, bring me job, bring me joy. Oh, Taylor, the latte boy, I love him, I love him, I love him. And I'd like to get my nerve up and recite my poem musical. He would like the Baptist musical because he plays guitar. And today at 8-11, Taylor told me he 
was playing with a band down in the village in the basement of a bar. And he smoothly flipped the lever to prepare my double latte. But for me, he made a triple, and he didn't think I knew. But I saw him flip the lever, and for me, he made a triple. And I knew that triple latte meant that Taylor loved me too. I said, what time are you playing? And thank you for the extra skill. He said, keep the 355. Because this triple latte was on him. Taylor, the latte boy, bring me Java, bring me joy. Oh, Taylor, the latte boy, I love him, I love him, I love him. I used to be the kind of
Dave's Gone By listeners know I love a good play on words. But let me say a good word on plays, my plays, collected in a lovely book called Marriage, Babies, and the End of the World. Comedies that range from strange to deranged, from sad to satirical, fun to read, and unmistakably Dave. Just $20 hardcover, $12 soft, put down that crappy bestseller and pick up some laughs. 516-295-1511 or davesgoneby.com. Hi, this is playwright Michael Weller. You're listening to Dave's Gone By on WGBB. Nice to talk to you today. And welcome back, everybody, to Dave's Gone By. Hope you liked the music there. As we heard, Taylor the Latte Boy, followed by Amy Rigby's Knapsack. That was from her uh, Diary of a Mod Housewife album. And we've got one more song coming at the end of the show, again, about someone who, who requites for someone else but it's a different caste system, a different social level, and, and a different kind of business. Anyway, I'm very happy to have with me, finally, in the studio, back from Florida, back from the theater today, my good friend Jeff Goodman. And um, Jeff, let's see, Jeff, well, Jeff saw two shows today, so I guess we'll talk about the theater with him. Jeff, what did you see today? Uh, today I saw Martin Short. Fame Becomes Me, and uh, Kiki and Herb, Alive and Kicking on Broadway. Now, neither of these has officially opened yet, although I think the short show opens very, very imminently. The short show opens on Tuesday, I think. Okay. And um, and I think Kiki and Herb open Thursday or Friday. Thursday. Opens Thursday. So you saw them still kind of in previews, but not so much early previews. Actually, Martin Short opens on the 17th, which I think is Thursday. Yeah, this coming Thursday. And, then and Kiki, Kiki and Herb open Wednesday. Okay, so what did you think? Um, I like both. I really liked both a lot. Um, I love Martin Short. I thought, and I, I, I do like Kiki and Herb, but I thought it was a little bit much for Broadway theater goers. And it's certainly not family oriented. <laughs> okay, well, well then let's take Kiki and Herb then. What, first, you, we talked off the air and you mentioned that it's two and a half hours long. It, it, well, it does have an intermission, which is kind of rare for new shows these days. For some reason, huh. we're going intermissionless. Okay. Which well, I what is, can you, uh, quickly explain what uh, Kiki is and the Herb are actually, uh, Justin Bond plays Kiki and, um, Kenny oh, Melman. Kenny Melman, thank you, plays mm -hmm. Herb. And they're an old, um, they play, it, it's currently like the 90s for them. I think it's always the 90s for them because they're an older musical couple. They're like an old, um, cabaret act mm -hmm. had, who had some success. They're, they're like, Nobody's who are, who are has been, <laughs> and they're making a comeback. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so basically, they were okay in the fifties. Then they to be in the sixties, they got mod and they got groovy in the seventies. On the eighties, they were like on the love boat. So <laughs> and also there was like tremendous amounts of substance abuse. I think going alcoholism. Oh well, yeah. Kiki does drink an awful lot during the show. Oh, even still during the show, she oh, oh, was rather solid. Oh oh, yeah. that's that's the whole the whole act is that Kiki starts out being. You know, not great, but and and just drinks and drinks and gets drunk as she goes on. So she's basically not falling down drunk, but she's she's Mel Gibson drunk. <laughs> <laughs> she tells what's on her mind. So so you love the first act, but I like both acts. Oh, okay. But you know, but her uh, it's a long show. Two and a half hours is a long time for just two people, as you said. Mm -hmm. And also the fact it has a very, very core audience, which which is gay. And um, it, it's very pro-gay. It's very left-wing. And I think a lot of people... I think there are people... Well, I mean, New Yorkers are going to be left-wing <laughs> and pro-gay, but it's a, it's a lot to take if it goes that long It does. just two people. You it know? does. It, it, and and I, lo I loved it. I mean, I thought it was okay, but I did think it's it's rather long. Okay. But but I enjoyed, you know, pretty much every moment of it. But as you said, Martin Short goes a full two hours with intermission, which is a... No intermission in Martin with, Short. With no intermission, which is a heck of a... I mean, that's asking a lot of Oh, my God, he changes yet, costumes constantly. But you said you didn't feel it? You said oh, you could have gone longer. I could have gone six hours with Martin Short. I thought it was great. I think Mark Shaman wrote a wonderful musical about his fake life. Okay. And, and it's brilliant. And Mark Shaman is in it. He plays his sister. <laughs> <laughs> really? Only in one scene, but it, 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 it's so hard to describe the show. Wait till you see it. It's, it's absolutely a must-see. So it really is a must-see. There, there are all your favorite Martin Short characters are in it. 
Or oh, certainly boy, talks Mr. Thurm and, and not Ed Grimley. Oh, no, no, Mr. Thurm doesn't make an appearance. Right. Uh, he's the lawyer. Yes, Ed Grimley comes in. Oh, he, he really brings in Grimley, Ed wow. Grimley, uh, yeah, they talk okay. about Ed Grimley's rise to fame at, at, <laughs> to Ca Carnegie Hall, where he plays a triangle. Because remember, uh, Ed Grimley plays a triangle. Yes, I, okay. I, I, it's been a while. I yeah. have to brush up on my shorts. But, but <laughs> I'm, I'm always short, but I have to brush up on my Martin short, I should say, yeah. But they and, and he I, actually in the very beginning Jackie Rogers Jr. is there. Oh yes. And and he he does. Well, not Sammy Davis Jr. That would be too tough to. No, uh, he doesn't. No, but he does. He does bring. Um, oh well, and yes, I know. He's got Jeff uh, is doing the thing with a hand under the, uh, under the chin. Uh, but who is that? The balloons, balloons. Oh, Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> she, he he brings Catherine Hepburn on oh, the my, my on the on the. Uh, the Jackie Rob, uh, the Jackie uh, Roger show. Rogers oh, Jr. show, no, and, way, and yeah. also, by the way, so Liz and Dick come on there too. Now you should Elizabeth explain Taylor that. Taylor and Richard Burton, or Liz with her, uh, well, I mean, her plastic friend. No, but it's not quite a one-man show. You should explain that. that oh there's no, other and, it's, in it. and it's actually it's it's actually a complete musical under the guise of a one-man show. It's a complete show. It has, but it's it's a big musical with six characters. It's only six people. And they play a million characters. Well, then again, so is Brooklyn. <laughs> well, the Broadway musical Brooklyn. Brooklyn is, that, this remember is that? much, much better. Yeah, I would hope so. It's, it's and by the way, it's in the fabulous Bernard B. Jacobs Theatre, which we used to be what? It was a renamed. That was the Royale. Oh, what a wonderful name that was! Oh yeah, that's the name of that's the name. Well, of he has that. a great line Not in Bernard the show. B. Jacobs. See, he's so dry. I love him. Yeah. He one of the one of the, my my favorite lines in the beginning. It's not giving away too much. He goes. Well, I came to the lovely Bernard B. Jacobs Theater. They, I took a cab because they wouldn't give him a limo. He goes from his Bernard B. Jacobs Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the Bernard B. Jacobs Restaurant, which is just yes, around the corner from the Bernard B. Jacobs Hardware Store. <laughs> and of course, the Bernard B. Jacobs Souvenir Shop. Cool. Everything can be bought in the lobby, by the way. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay. And and so, did you buy anything? No. Is there already a CD of it? Oh, um. I don't know. I, I actually didn't. Re I, we passed by rather quickly. We were on our way out to dinner, so. Ah, good. Did you have a nice meal? Oh, it was lovely. You and your friend Charles? It was kosher. Kosher meal. Where, where? Oh, we, we walked a good, like, 20 blocks, mm -hmm. and I paid $7 for a hamburger deluxe, which God only knows. In kosher, it just means it's a hamburger with onions. No french fries with no, a deluxe? No, no. <laughs> They, they, no just, they just put I mean, this it's kosher meat, so it's they, expensive. They put this, oh, yeah, and then Charlie tells me, he, he tells me, but they slit the cow's throat just for you. I said, ooh, that makes it much more tasty. <laughs> well, they drain the blood into the burger, so I said, no, they, no, no, they don't. Hey, I've got to wrap thing up, things up. I hate to oh, say yeah, it, but right. it's 11.58, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to thank my good Except friend. if you're listening on the web, it's 11.59. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the clock just ticked forward a little bit. Or if you're listening in California, hell, you've got a whole night left ahead of you. So... <laughs> yeah. But I, I want to thank Jeff Goodman for, for popping in and, and giving us his theater stuff. And then, you know, we'll be, of course, seeing you soon many times on Dave's Gone By. Um, thanks again to Peter Fitzgerald and to Patrick Kalinan from the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. Go see their Titan Aram. It's still there. It's bloomed, but it's still there. And I think you can still get a little whiff of funk if you really get up <laughs> close to it. Thank you, MortgagesRock.com, for being a wonderful sponsor. Thank you also to Hewlett Minuteman Press for the, the best copies and printing and binding. Remember that Dave's Gone By listeners get 10% off at Hewlett Minuteman Press. And also, if you subscribe to Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine, it's everything you need to know about Broadway, Off-Broadway, and beyond. Check out Fancy Schmancy Balloons from Jeff. Jeff, what's the phone number there for people who are planning parties? It's 516-797-3229. One more time. 516-797-3229. Right, and that's for fancy schmancy balloons. And of course, I want to thank my beloved and fancy schmancy wife, Joyce, for uh, being with me in the studio today. It was great to have her around, as it's great to have her around all the time. I want to give a shout out of best wishes to Alex O'Brien on his third birthday. Many, many more. Uh, I, already, I think I gave out a shout out to the library lady, Pam, and Glenn, the library man. Good to, to see you guys. Catch a vintage Dave's Gone By Saturday night at 11 on DFSX Radio, and you can listen directly on the web through my website, davesgoneby.org. Next week, cool show. I've got Jack Kenny, who's a photographer, and he's been photographing Cuba, being back and forth from America to Cuba 
40 times in the past 10 years. So he's a lot to say about Castro and life there and what he's seen and what he does. Jack Kenny on Dave's Gone By next week, August 20th. Well, as promised, I'm going to go out with one more song, another unrequited working class love song, Tom Waits' Invitation to the Blues. I'll leave you with that. But I will be back next week with the 185th edition of Dave's Gone By. Until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz saying good night. Take time to smell the flowers, preferably without barfing. And gone by. Left to 